Well, good morning and welcome. We are glad to be back and see you. And uh, we're looking forward to a protected time here with you so you won't get rid of us too soon. But hopefully, real soon, we get to welcome Pastor uh, Jamie and Amy here. And uh, that we're working on the visa process, and uh, God is helping us move that along. So we're really excited. But the big news is, Pastor Mike, we are glad that you are here today. We want to say thank you. For most of us in this room, not all of us in this room, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the way that God used you to bring us to this church. And thank you for trusting me with that sermon series that one summer we were together. You've won people to Christ in this room. We uh, praise God for you. And scripture says, honor, give honor to those whom honor is due. And we want to honor you and thank you for your labor of love and your service. Give our hugs and alohas to Amanda and your children, and uh, thank you for taking the time to worship with us today. Well, that was a beautiful Christmas carol you just sang, and I want to say thank you to the uh, worship team for leading us in that song, Oh, Come All You What? Unfaithful. Now, I didn't choose this series, but uh, the guy who did is not here today, so I can talk about him. He's working. Let's get that slide up if you could uh, just. Here we go. This is a beautiful title that uh, Christian Bendo helped me choose and put together for us. The idea that so often at Christmas time we say to folks, okay, come all ye faithful, but what about people who feel unfaithful? And the first time you saw this slide, you may have said, oh, oh, come all ye faithful. And then you went back and read it a second time and said, wait, it says unfaithful. And what we want to say to you today is that whether you feel you've been faithful this year, whether it's been a good year, whether you've slipped and fallen and you're back here today, whether it's been a tough year or you've been faithful all year long, we want you to come back to the manger to worship Jesus this Christmas time in a new and fresh manner. And we want to welcome all of you today, no matter what has gone on in this past year. So Christian kicked off last week uh, preaching about the priest and the pauper or the poor girl. The priest being Zacharias and the uh, pauper being Mary. And when uh, the priest heard about the, his son that would be born to his wife who was barren, he's like, no, nah, that can't be. And so he was struck dumb and he didn't get to talk for a long, long time actually for the nine months. But when Mary the poor girl was told that she was going to have a baby and the baby would be the Messiah, her faith grew. And so you, we saw the contrast between the priest and the poor girl. Faithful and unfaithful. Where do you put yourself today? We're going to look at uh, Luke chapter 2 today, and we'll be focusing on Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 21. That doesn't mean that verses 1 through 7 are not important. We'll be going over the, those. We have a Christmas Eve service. We're going to have appetizers beforehand at 5 o'clock and Christmas cookies, and the Christmas Eve service will be at 6 o'clock. We'll have readings and carols, and we'll be uh, have a message that will be help us celebrate Christmas. But just for now, look at the first seven verses, and remember, you can almost say those by heart. It's about the census that happened in, uh, in Bethlehem, and Joseph and Mary had to go there. They were really faithful. It was a 90-mile journey, a three-day journey at least, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's where Joseph's family was born. There was no room for them in the inn. And so they had to give birth to their firstborn son, verse 7, and wrapped him in linen cloths, wound him up real tight, like we do, we swaddle children now, but this was a a special wrapping in linen cloths because he wasn't inside. He was out in a manger, a cattle trough, because there was no room for him in the inn, which is verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. He arrives, the greatest news on earth. The Savior is born. Men and women can be reconciled with God. They can find peace with God. It's still the greatest good news of all time. And look how silently he comes. And when God wants to tell the world that something great has happened and salvation is here and eternity is open to men and women again, he chooses to announce it 
to some men out in the fields that you and I would never have chosen. One of the reasons we love the Bible is because it's so unexpected. If a Jewish historian had written the story, he never would have written in a, a made up some story about shepherds on a hillside that heard the news of Jesus' birth. But this, that's what happened. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, And in the same region on the hills outside of Bethlehem, there were shepherds out in the field. You know what shepherds do at night? They count sheep to stay awake. How many of you count sheep to go to sleep? I don't know if anybody does, but that's, the state, that's what people say. So they're out there counting the sheep to stay awake. They're keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appears to them, verse 9 of chapter 2, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And that word great, there's actually the word mega. It's mega fear. I mean, it's terrified. They are, it, I, I like to imagine that it was kind of like a burst of lightning that just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I don't know if there was lightning, but there was light because it shone. You see the word, it shone around them. And God chose to choose people that we would regard, or in those days would be regarded as, as unfaithful, to hear the news of Jesus' birth for the very first time, why didn't he go to the Roman palace where Governor Quirinius lived? Why didn't he go to King Herod's palace? Why didn't he appear to the high priest in the temple? Well, when the shepherds heard, they were viewed as unfaithful. And if God can bring this message to shepherds on the hillside who were scruffy people that didn't wash very often, who lived out 24-7 in the fields, weren't able to participate in temple worship because they couldn't uh, fulfill all the ceremonial laws about washing your hands and washing your clothes. In fact, the Pharisees looked down on them and regarded them as kind of unworthy people. They even said that uh, they were not allowed to testify in a court of law because you couldn't trust a shepherd. And so as time went on, they were not only considered the lower part of the social ladder, but they were also considered as untrustworthy and not people to be trusted. But God chose to bring the announcement of the birth of Jesus, the greatest announcement ever made to a group of shepherds on a hillside outside of Bethlehem. And so as they heard this message, and you hear it again today, and there's something about the familiarity of the Christmas message that if we're not careful, we are inclined to forget how important it is. One of the reasons I love to preach about Christ at Christmas is because he's the center of our message, and he is the center of our hope, and he is the truth, and he is the way, and he is the life. And we can preach the Old Testament, the New Testament. We've been through the book of, uh, of the Genesis. We've been through the book of ne Nehemiah. But we've got to always get back to Christ. And Pastor Mike, you did that really well for us. Always took it back to Christ. And so we want to think about him today. And we want to think about him in these Sundays leading up to Christmas. And we want to come back and say to ourselves, whether we've been unfaithful or faithful, whether you feel like, it's a better Christmas or a worse Christmas. Whether you feel like you slipped up or you slipped forward or you've, you're doing better, remember that the Christmas message is for all of us and God is no respecter of persons. See, I'm sure the Jewish people and the priests, that we know they taught that Jesus would come as a conquering king. They never expected him to come in a manger. This is wrong. This doesn't fit the narrative. Here's a... a cattle trough that's messy and dirty and there's a baby lying in a manger. You know the wonderful thing about God? He is no respecter of persons. He doesn't care about how much money you have, how much education you have, how old you are, how young you are. He treats us all the same. Is that good news? That's good news. And so James says, he gives grace generously and God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. You know, it's, it's amazing how, how much we think of ourselves. I read a statistic this week where 90% of college professors, tell Noah this when he gets home, 90% of college professors consider them to be, themselves to be in the top 10% of their profession. 
<laughs> you met the guys, you know, at school. Well, I'm a teacher. I'm in the top 10% of my profession. 90% of professors think they are. We always think a little bit of ourselves than we really should. And so God is no respecter of persons. And he reminds us through the story of the shepherds who loved a calm, predictable, cold winter night, no disturbance. He reminds us that he is the God for the faithful, the unfaithful, the young and the old. He is no respecter of persons. You know, when you're a shepherd out counting sheep, you don't want anyone to disturb you. I mean, if the sheep start to rustle and move and, and, and bah, 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 then, you, then you're like, something's up. Is it a lion? Is it a bear? Is it a poacher? Something's wrong, and so you just want a calm, calm night, counting the sheep, when suddenly, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appears to them, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were feared, they were filled with mega fear. And this angel, it's a good thing it was only one to begin with. Do you see that? How many afterwards? So many they couldn't count them, but it's only one right now. He says to them, fear not. Sound familiar? That's what the angel said to Zacharias in Luke 1.13. That's what the angel said to Mary in Luke 1 verse 30. Fear not, because I bring you a, a great message. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for who? A select group of people for all people. For unto who? The priests? No, unto you, the shepherds, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I want you to stop for a minute and take your thoughts and your heart back and Imagine you were there with the shepherds and you heard this message for the first time and, it's, and you think with me about the message they received. It's an amazing message. I bring you, you are unfaithful, look down upon people. I bring you good news. I don't know why in America we're... we're we're addicted to bad news because we turn the TV on all the time. I mean, turn the TV on, you're always going to see bad news. I mean, I, I took Fox News and CNN and all those apps off my phone. And, you know, it's just like, I don't want to hear bad news all the time. So good news is really good because it's, it's so different. And Jesus, uh, the angels say about Jesus, this is good news. And this word here in the in the original is the word euangelion, from which we get the word gospel. This is good news about, and we're going to talk about what it is. It brings great joy. It's for everybody. And I want you to focus with me for just a minute on the good news that the angels talk about. No need to be afraid. There's good news out there. If you want your fear button to go up, just watch the, the local news, the national news, the international news. If you want to hear good news, you've got to come to the Bible. You've got to see the good news about what God has done in Christ. And we celebrate that at Christmas and see how this world is going to come to an end. And Jesus will return as conquering king and Lord. And this is good news. And it's one of Luke, Dr. Luke. It's one of his favorite terms. And he uses it more than any other writer in the New Testament. He likes the word good news. And the good news is that God sent a Savior to redeem us from our sins. It's explained in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, that's important, a, what? A Savior. A Savior. Say it with me. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do you realize that Luke loves this word Savior? Matthew and Mark never use it. There are several commentaries out there that use, you know, the Savior of the world when they're talking about Luke's gospel. Paul uses it a lot, but Matthew and Mark never use it. John uses it. Unto you is born this day a Savior. They were expecting a, a ruler, a political deliverer, somebody who would be a take charge of the state affairs and would deliver them, but Jesus comes. 
as a savior. You've heard this before. If our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us, and say it with a smile, a Savior. Can't say Savior without smiling. Well, maybe you can, but I can't. John said it this way in his epistle that he wrote, his letter at the end of his life. 1 John 4 and verse 14, And we have seen, let's read it together, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. It's good news because Jesus saves us from our sins. Only Jesus does. And I'm not sure we talk enough about that in church or in families or in our small groups. My mom used to always judge church by whether the preacher talked about the Savior. And so here she is, she's almost 99 years old, and she didn't, can't talk this way anymore, but she'd say, well, it was an okay message, but he never mentioned the Savior, Jesus. See, she was 17 years old when she got saved in, a, in an Anglican church, Episcopal church, Church of England. She had lots of rectors, ministers come through, but they never told her how to get saved until a missionary, a person who had been a missionary, came back to a church, and when she was 17 years old, this pastor for the first time told her that she needed a savior. Her mom and dad were not saved. She received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and immediately went and told her best friend. My mom was an only child and her best friend was an only child. And her best friend gave her heart to Jesus because she told about a savior. And his, he's a savior because he's Christ. That means Messiah. Born in the, in, in the city of David, that's where the Messiah was prophesied that he would be born. The one chosen to save the Jewish people, to bring us redemption. He is Christ, anointed one, deliverer. And he's Lord, curios, which is the word that signifies his, his deity, his kingship. The fact that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. It's the personal name for God himself, and he's lying in a manger. And I said this to Christian, and Melissa's not here, but I said, you know, Christmas is going to be different for you this year, Christian. And by the way, we're glad to see the rest of the family here, Jonathan. Because you have in your hands a little baby. Her name is Aria. And Arya can look at the little baby in the manger and say, that's Jesus. And he's my Savior. He came for me. See, if Jesus had come for, as a teenager, then all the children would have said, well, he's not for me because he doesn't understand what it's like to be an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old. If Jesus had come at age 40, everybody under age 40 would say, well, he's, he doesn't understand. But he came as a baby, God incarnate, Christ the Lord. And with my grandkids and your grandkids, you can point at Jesus and say, there's the baby Jesus. He came to save you. Every person of every age can relate to the Savior. Every person of every place and every stage. If he was born in a hotel, they'd say, well, I, my house isn't as good as that. No, he was born in a manger. If he, had born in, if he had been born of a certain status, they'd say, well, we can't relate to Jesus because he lived in a magnificent temple. No, he didn't have anywhere to live. He was born in a manger. So let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Is he your Christ? Is he your Lord? Because it's good news for you, but you've got to receive it. See, if you don't respond to the message, then you haven't done anything with it. And the angels not only received the message, but they responded to the message. I want you to see how they responded. It's good news, it's joy, it's peace, and there is suddenly an, a, a, 
a, a whole lot of angels who joined this, this uh, one angel in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude that's like myriad, more than you can count, more than you can ever believe. And they're all singing and they're singing together. There's a heavenly host. We assume they're singing, but they're praising God and they're saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased to dwell. So there's good news. It's good news of joy. And if your good news doesn't bring you joy, then it's not really good news. And it also brings you peace. Joy, because the gap between a sovereign God, a holy God, and a sinful human race has been bridged by the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes into our lives, we find a joy that's unspeakable that we want to share with everybody we know. A peace that comes from knowing that we are now reconciled with God. We're not fighting him anymore. There's not a war going on anymore. We actually have found peace with God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we respond in faith, we receive Peace, because we've made, been made just as if we never sinned by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We find peace in ourselves. And we find peace with others. It's good news, folks. It's the gospel. We have gos the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and... And they're all called gospels because they are about the euangelion. They tell the good news about Christ, the Lord, the Savior, who brings joy and peace. Now, this may not be for everybody here, but you know, there's a tendency today for people to talk about gospel every time they talk about the Lord or the Bible. So they talk about gospel praying, gospel family devotions, gospel Bible reading, gospel. Everything's about the gospel. But what I want to say to you is, if everything is the gospel, then if we're not careful, we water it down. So I, I teach some students, say, well, I had a gospel conversation. What do you mean? Well, I mentioned Jesus. Well, you didn't really have a gospel conversation because a gospel conversation means you tell people that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the Lord, and he is the Christ. So don't fall into that trap, if you would. Be careful of that. Not everything's gospel unless it talks about Christ, the Lord, the Savior. Nobody got saved just by saying they heard the gospel. They had to hear about Christ, the Lord, the Savior. And they have to respond. So this was a message the shepherds received. This is a message they responded to. Look how they responded. Verse 15. And when the angels went away, a lot of us would have said, well, that's it. I got to go take a nap. Ah, uh, that was too much for me one night. I can't make it to church. No, I'm just kidding. They said, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord had made known to us. We can't wait. Let's go down there and see. We know that he's, he's lying in a manger. That's what we know. We know he's going to be wrapped in all these cloths. And let's see what really happened for ourselves. It's one thing to hear the message, it's another thing to respond to it. And so they went just as slow as they could. Now, what does it say? And they went as quick as they could. I, I, I can just imagine them running down the hillside with their, their smelly old clothes and the shepherd's staff in their hand. Maybe they took a lamb or two with them that they couldn't leave on the hillside. And they went in haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. They could have stayed on the hillside two and a half miles away and said, well, that's good news. That's great for you. It's good for your friends. It's good for your wife. It's good for your kids. But is it good enough for you? It's good for me, but I don't want to get too involved in this myself. No, it's good for all of us. He is Christ the Lord. And so as they responded and hurried down the hillside, they were actually responding in faith and in obedience. And they went and did what the angels told them to do, to worship Christ the Lord. 
you know what's kind of interesting is that all of us are responding at different different levels today. I sometimes wish when I preached, Pastor Mike, I had a little gauge on the top of your head and I could see how you're responding. No, I'm kidding. That would be dangerous. We, we, we couldn't do that, no. But wouldn't it be interesting if we all had a gauge and said, well, how are they responding to the message? Actually, you do respond through your face and your body language. But have you ever received the good news, not just heard the message, but responded to it in obedience and faith so that you can say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I found the peace and joy. That's not just good enough for everybody else, but it's mine as well. And you know what they did when they got down there? This is something that just came to me vividly this week as I was studying. And when they saw it, that's Mary and Joseph, this is verse 17. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So here, Mary and Joseph, they're young. They've got this new baby. They're trying to figure out what to do with him. And they realize he's special. They've been told his name is to be Jesus. Why? Because Jesus means he's going to save the, the people from their sins. But as they're trying to figure out what to do with him, they've got these shepherds. And what are the shepherds doing? They're telling Mary and Joseph what happened on the hillside. And they're helping them understand who Jesus is. Hey, Mary, Joseph, we were up on the hills tonight, and I want to tell you about this message that we heard. It was concerning this child, the one you're looking at. Mary, it's the baby that you're holding. It's about this child. He is the Savior for all people. Hey, Joseph, listen. He is the, he is the one that is Christ that's been promised for thousands of years. Joseph, he is the Lord. And Joseph said, yeah, we, we understood that, but let me tell you, you should have been there. It was like lightning all over the hills as the hills shone. And you should have heard the angels when they sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill to all men. Mary and Joseph, they explained to Mary and Joseph what had happened. And concerning this child, they fill in some of the blanks for them. See, they're very vital to the story, but also in verse 18, And then they just went around Bethlehem, and it's not a very big town. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them, because the shepherds told them not just what happened, but why it happened and what it meant. That Christ, the Lord, the Savior had come. And to all who will believe and repent and trust him, he gives a joy and a peace that is unspeakable. And there's Mary. Mary must have been an S or a C, you know, we're just talking disc here, but Mary was, there's Mary, and she's just sitting there holding the baby, and what does verse 19 say? She's pondering these things. She's thinking about them. You know, there's nothing like a mama thinking. You can't always tell what a mama's thinking, but a mama thinks a lot more than most people. And she's treasuring in her heart all these things that the shepherds are telling them about Jesus, and she's probably saying, wow. How do we do this? What do we do? There's a message that the shepherds received. There's a manner in which they responded. And then I just want to give you this. And there's a major report that everybody needs to hear. The people in your house need to hear it. The people at your work. The people you fly with on the airplane. The people that you meet at the beach. The people that you could invite to our Christmas Eve service, tell them about the cookies and the appetizers. I don't know why we call them appetizers. Everything's appetizing here, but they're going to be finger foods before the Christmas Eve service. More people, six out of ten Americans, will go to some kind of Christmas Eve service. Hawaii loves Christmas. Never figured that out because there's no snow. I'm just kidding. But that's why we love Christmas in Hawaii. But would you give a manger report to somebody this year? And by that, I mean an invitation to come. Like the shepherds did in verse 20, the shepherds returned from Bethlehem, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and and heard. As it has been told them, they couldn't help giving a manger report. See, seeing the baby Jesus was not enough for the shepherd. They had to share the story. We say... In where I'm from, we say, save people share and save people serve. 
There's something about it. Once you're saved, you want to share. Once you're saved, you want to serve. And I'm thrilled just in the few weeks I've been gone, I came back and see some more people serving today. But we also need to be about sharing. And everybody they ran into, whether it was in Bethlehem or out in the fields when they got back to their sheep, wherever they went, they told the story about Jesus. One last thing. These shepherds, what kind of sheep were they looking after? Edeshim, who wrote a book in the 19th century, he, was a, he became a follower of Christ as a Jew. He gave us some information that's become kind of a, about the life and the times of Jesus has become very important as a reference for us to understand the Gospels. He drew our attention in the 19th century to the fact that in the Mishnah, some of the re religious writings of the Jewish people, there was a, a law that went like this. All sheep are to stay in the wilderness. The only sheep that can be near Bethlehem on the hillside are sheep that are going to be offered for temple sacrifice. So what kind of shepherds were these? Perhaps and probably in my mind, and I'll let you come to your conclusion, shepherds looking after sheep that are actually being prepared for sacrifice in Jerusalem. This sign, what is the sign? The baby born in the manger or the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes? I'm not sure. I think it's both, but I think it's, it's interesting. Because in verse 7, we see that Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then the sign for the shepherds is, go down and find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. And I'm just going to tell you things that we read. They're not in the Bible, but I think they're significant. These shepherds, as they raised the lambs on the hillsides, they were presented in the temple. They had to be the best. They had to be the perfect. They had to be without blemish and without spot. And so when the shepherds carried them down the hillside, they would wrap them very carefully in strips of cloth so that when they got for the temple sacrifice, they were absolutely without spot or blemish. So these shepherds were special shepherds if they were the ones that raised the sheep for the temple sacrifices. And as they worshipped, they not only were worshipping the Son of God, they were worshipping the Lamb of God, who would give his life for the sins of the world. Maybe they understood a little bit more than we think. And Luke is really interested in these cloths that they wrapped the baby in. And I know they wrapped all babies in, in cloth in those days, but this is a sign. This is something a little bit more. He's in a manger, and so he needs a little more wrapping in, in these swaddling cloths, we sometimes call them. But that's how you're going to recognize them, shepherds. And maybe one or two of them had a little sacrificial lamb under their arms. We don't know. But we do know this. The baby grew, and he obeyed his mom and dad, and he became a teacher, and he lived a perfect life, the only one who's ever lived a perfect life. And still he was criticized and misunderstood and crucified by the religious leaders of the day with the help of the Roman governor for a crime he never committed, but because he was dying in my place and yours as the savior of the world, the lamb of God that the shepherds worshiped. They were really the first believers. They were the first ones who came and bowed down to worship Jesus. They, if they followed his ministry, would, know, would have known about his crucifixion. Maybe they understood it better than you thought we think. And it's very interesting that when Jesus was crucified on the cross and he said, Father, it is finished. I've done the work you gave me to do. 33 years later, they laid him in a tomb, cut out of a rock. Maybe the stable was cut out of a rock, we're not sure. And when they took him down from the cross, Luke says this, John says it, they took the body of Jesus and they wrapped it in strips of cloth 
with air aromatic spices according to the burial custom of the Jews. And he was dead and buried and laid in a tomb for my sins and yours. But on the third day, not the Roman seal of the tomb, not the Roman guards outside, not all the forces of evil, not the strips of cloth that were round, bound around his body could hold him back. Because God raised him from the dead and he's alive today and he's alive forevermore. And when they came to the tomb and they looked inside, you know what they saw? No body, they just saw the strips of cloth wrapped in the shape of a body, I believe, with the cloth that was over his head, the cloths that were over his head a little way away. Mary, did you know? Probably not everything that you knew that day. Mary, you were one of those who helped wrap his body. Acts 1 and 14 says Mary and the other women were there and they were thinking about his death and his resurrection. And if shepherds can come to a baby who's born, who becomes the king of kings and savior of the world is Christ the Lord, why don't you come? What's holding you back? Why don't you come again this Christmas time? Make 2022 the day that you come back in repentance and faith. If you've been unfaithful, rededicate your life, recommit to him. All of us have done these new things. And the, the call today is for, oh, come all. That's how we're going to move forward with this series, oh, come all. Come all, come one, come all, come as you are. Worship the king and catch a glimpse of what the shepherds saw. Would you bow with me in prayer?